Father, we love you. Lord, we've come to worship. We say that you're good. We love you, Jesus.
walking around these walls. I thought by now they'd fall, but you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come. Knowing the battles won, for you have never failed me yet. You promised it stands. Great is your faith.
still in your hands This is my confidence You never fail Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. So cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in the sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous. In burnt offerings offered whole, then bulls will be offered on your altar. Okay, what's the worst thing that you have ever done? (laughs) I don't mean the worst thing that you're willing to tell other people or even the thing that you're willing to make jokes about or that you think might be kind of silly that you're willing to talk about. I'm talking about right now, just in your mind, think about the worst thing that you have ever done. And one of the temptations is to think that I am so messed up, so bad, done something so wrong that I can't be close to God. But here's David and in Psalm 51, David confesses his sin to God. And I don't care how bad the idea, the memory that just came to your head is, I think David's is worse. <laughs> just bear with me for a minute because we've been reading the Psalms and, and for a day coming before God and saying, God, we're looking to you. And in these Psalms, we've read Psalms of Lament. Like Psalm 22, where we say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we've learned how to pray by just getting real with God and saying, here's what I'm going through. Here's my challenge. Here's what's hurting. Here's what I need from you. That's a Psalm of Amen. Or some of us have been falling in love with those Psalms that help us get close to God. 
That comes along in Psalm 27. We talked about that one even on one of the Sundays. This one thing I ask, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. Or Psalm 84, where we prayed that idea of, God, I want to dwell in your house. Better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. I love God. I love His presence. Love those. Or Psalm 100. Maybe you read that in your four Psalms a day about entering into His gates with thanksgiving in your heart and His courts with praise. It's this adoration and this worship. This journey through Psalms has been a great journey. Sometimes we think that what we've done has caused us to be too far from God and impossible to be close to Him. And today, I want you to see that David prays a prayer of confession or a psalm of confession that helps him be close to God. And so there's the prayer of lament or there's the prayer of being close to God. Or there's a prayer of praise. But here's a prayer of confession. In Psalm 51 is David confessing his sin before God. And my dream is that we would enter into a lifestyle of confession, praying confession, coming before God. Sometimes when you think of confession, many people think it's something that you prayed one time. So you decided not to be the Lord of your own life and let Jesus be the Lord of your life. Receive the free gift of salvation and you confess. Here's what I've lived in in the past. I'm going to get right with God. I'm going to confess my sin before God. And so you had a prayer of repentance and you confessed your sin. And so confession was a part of your life once. But what happens when it's not one time, but it's over and over and over again. Maybe if we have a vision to be close to God, and we know that John says in 1 John 2, 6, that anyone who claims to be in Christ must walk as Jesus did, that you've got this vision to be close to God and to be like Jesus. So anytime that you miss the mark and you wanna come before God and get close to Him, maybe confession is your friend. Maybe confession isn't something that you do once. Maybe confession is every time that you know, I, I, my life does not look like what I want it to. I, my life does not look like God. I want to be close to God and I've missed the mark and there's sin in my life that we come back and we confess. and We make this psalm or any prayer of confession our friend. I was thinking about uh, this sweatshirt, which I enjoy using over and over again. Maybe you have something in your house that you use over and over again. A favorite mug, favorite pair of jeans, favorite shoes, something that you just seem to use over and over again. Renata and I took a bunch of young people on a retreat to Breckenridge in 2001. That's why it says fall retreat Breck 01. And we had these sweatshirts made and somehow I love this sweatshirt and I use it for walks. I use it to play basketball in. I've used it over and over again. So many of my clothes are no longer with me, but this one has been around for 19 years. I go back to it over and over again. And I was just thinking about prayers of confession or something that you go back to over and over again. Prayers of confession are this way of getting my attention off of my sin and getting my focus onto God. And when we look at people who are close to God, there's these psalms of confession or prayers of confession that help us get close to him. So here's David. David's situation is pretty bad. <laughs> so he comes before God. And if you look backwards on his resume, he has murder on his resume. He's just decided to have Uriah killed. And you go back further, that was because he took Uriah's wife when he shouldn't have, which was adultery and he tried to cover up what he did so he had murder and adultery trying to cover up his sin and Nathan the prophet comes before him in 2 Samuel 12 and says hey let me tell you a story about someone who took what wasn't his and he says you're the man that's been doing it and he confronts David and this context of Psalm 51 is when David comes before God after being called out on murder and adultery and trying to cover up his sin and I think when it comes to sin, it's easy for us to try to cover it up, maybe ignore it. Maybe we think that because it exists, we can no longer be close to God, but we don't wanna ignore our sin. We don't wanna to try to cover it up. We wanna confess it. And when we confess it before God, we come before Him and God with the character of love, with God who is the forgiver, Confession is our opportunity to have that relationship with God, get clean again. And that's what David says here in Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God. 
So confession is our avenue to being clean before God yet again, repenting of our sin before God and saying, God, I wanna be close to you again. And I don't care how messed up you are today. I don't care what's on your resume. You, like David, can be close to God. And there's a few things that David knew to be true about God that caused him to run to God and confess rather than run from God in condemnation. Now I wanna invite you to look at those things. Today we're gonna to look at God's heart. We're gonna look at God's eyes. And we're gonna look at God's hand, all in Psalm 51. My family recently watched the movie Les Miserables together and we loved it so much that uh, Alexa has been playing the soundtrack in our house ever since. And the great part of that story is the moment where everything shifts for Jean Valjean. Remember how Jean Valjean has a heart of stone until he experiences the loving kindness of the priest. And if the priest shows mercy to him that he doesn't deserve, he becomes a new man. And the story is about a man who fundamentally shifts how he responds to people and who he is because he's experienced kindness. He's experienced love. That's what Paul says in Romans 2, 4. He says, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. And that's actually where David starts right here in Psalm 51. He, he could start lots of places. And I think sometimes you and I like to start in confession on maybe our past resume. Hey God, I've done things for you before. God, here's what I've been in the past. Here's, here's the way that I've given or served, or here's the things that I've done. Great accolades for God. Or maybe it's our character. Hey God, remember the way that in times past, I've been this. I, 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 I loved well, or I, was a, I walked in righteousness in the past. David doesn't talk about his past character. He could, uh, he could talk about, hey, remember my courage against Goliath? Hey God, don't you remember you chose me because you saw me as pure in heart. You saw me as the one who was a man after your own heart. You saw the character in me. Remember the victories that I've had? Remember the way, here's David and in this story, I mean, he's already been king. He's already had the moment where he honored He's already had the moment where he had victories. He's already had the moments where he chose to be a man of prayer. David's got some good things on his resume, but it's not his resume that he comes to God with. It's God. Look at this verse one, he says, it's have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out transgression. God, it's your mercy, it's your love, it's your compassion. According to that, that's what I'm appealing to. And you and I, sometimes when it comes to confession, it's easy for us to just forget that and to go into who we've been, but this isn't about who we've been. This is about who he is. And the way forward into a life of confession is to start not with your resume, good or bad, not with your character, good or bad, but with God's heart. God, it is your love, it's your mercy, it's your compassion. That's when I came to know you, that's what changed me. You saved me. You turned this heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Actually, that's the way that David talks in verse 12, where he says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Think about the joy that we have in just beginning relationship with God and in being saved, being his, his children. I think that this idea of the joy of my salvation, restore unto me the joy of my salvation, I think this is what took place that caused David to even get distant and choose to sin. In other words, we sin when we're no longer satisfied with God. When our joy in God, when we lose the joy of our salvation, that's the point where we start to sin because no longer are we close, no longer are we with Him. Then we start to be more satisfied with the pleasures of the world rather than the pleasures of God. And so it's probably that David started to get distant. And so when there's that moment where he is standing on the roof of the palace and he sees Bathsheba, it's that distance that causes him then, ah, he engages in adultery and then murder. So it's twofold. It's definitely the joy on the flip side because now, now there's this barrier and I'm distant from God. I've chosen to live in isolation from God and engage in sin. And so David's surely saying, restore unto me the joy of my salvation like I used to have. But I think it's on both sides. I think it was on the backside of his sin and where he slowly started to distance himself from God and found himself into horrific sin. How do you move forward? How do you get to the place where there's confession alive inside of you, come before God like David did and start with God's heart. 
It's not about me and my resume. It's not about what I've done. It's not about who I am, good or bad. It's about who you are and who you are right now, God. God, according to your love, according to your mercy, according to your compassion. And each of us can have a successful life of confession, but it starts with running to the heart of God. Have you ever hurt the heart of somebody that you love a lot? <laughs> like you made a decision and then faced the pain of letting them down. I remember when I was uh, a teenager, actually junior high, and uh, my family had just moved from Moscow, Idaho to Oklahoma City. And I was 13 years old when this took place. And I went over to a friend's house. I didn't have many friends and I desperately wanted to have friends. And there was one kid that invited me to come spend the night at his house. And so we're at the house and I'm wanting desperately to just have anybody be my friend. And he said, I have an idea. Let's go TP your house. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, my mom will take us to the grocery store. We do this all the time. And we'll go buy toilet paper and shaving cream and we'll go TP your house. And I remember for a moment thinking that seems kind of strange, but this guy really wanted to do it. And so I looked at him like a brilliant 13 year old and said, bro, that sounds awesome, let's go. And we went to Food World and we bought about $16 worth of stuff. We took cereal, we took plastic forks that we broke off into the yard. We took shaving cream, whipped cream and toilet paper and we went to my house at night. And I, I at, at age 13, I engaged with my 13 year old friend at about 10 o'clock on a Friday night in secretly TPing my own house. And I'll just never forget the moment <laughs> where I had eye contact with my dad when he found out what I did. And honestly, in that moment, I wasn't so concerned about all of the punishment or what I did that I maybe shouldn't have done or how I could have done it different. There was just one thing that created pain in my heart is that I created pain in his heart. Because my dad was my best friend and my dad was loving me and discipling me and spending time uh, helping me walk through the hardest season. And in the midst of the hardest season, I decided to go ahead and <laughs> act like a crazy kid and toilet paper in my own house. And I just love this moment because this is what David is saying here when he talks in verse four about God's eyes. He's talking about God's perspective and and I remember in that moment what I cared about was just the way that my dad saw me and it's easy for us to think about well here's my perspective or here's what other people say about my sin but David here is saying it's not about what my perspective is it's not what other people say about my sin it's about how you see it look at this verse 4 he says against you you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight it's just about how you see it God and we can look at this story in 2 Samuel 12 and we can recognize, well, technically we could say there's a lot of other people that were violated that David sinned against. I mean, certainly Uriah is dead. David sinned against him. He certainly sinned against Bathsheba. He certainly sinned against Israel. He's the king and he's committing adultery and murder. But when you go down to the deeper level of what David is saying here, each one of those people are made in the image of God. And David is saying, Ultimately, yeah, I, I've, I have violated those people, but it's you at the deepest level. It's you that I disappointed. It's you that I sinned against. It's you that I did this wicked thing against. And because I was distant from you, I did it. And he says, against you, you only have I sinned. That means at the core, at the root, that's that's who I've sinned against. And that's where my pain is, is that I let God down. And God's the one that rescued me. God's the one that pulled me from the sheep pens and gave me a mission and a purpose. God's the one that gave me a role to play as the king and trusted me. And God's the one that I was known as the sweet psalmist of Israel, singing back who God is. And I've had that deep relationship with God. And now I chose this awful sin. And yeah, I violated a lot of people, but at the root, at the core, God against you and you only have I sinned. And I hate letting you down. 
David wanted to see it from God's perspective. Sometimes when we sin, it's easy for us to say, yeah, well, from my perspective, here's why I'm justified. Or other people will say, oh, come on, you're okay. Anybody would do in that situation what you did. Or even when we just look at cultural logic, people will say, let me give you my opinion on why what you did was okay. But it ultimately comes down to just one set of eyes that matters. What's God's perspective? What do we read about in the scriptures? So not what's your excuse. David could have made those. David could have said, God, come on. I'm the king. This is my palace. Bathsheba, she was just out bathing there. It's her fault. God, it's, it's, it's the responsibilities that I have. Being a king, it's so challenging. No, no, no. It's none of those things. It's no excuses. It's just in your eyes. That's what I care about. What would happen if we had that vision? God, how do you see this? How do you see my life? Not what other people tell me is okay. Not the excuses that I make. And sometimes we're doing this even in this pandemic. Oh, the pandemic. <laughs> the pandemic is making me be angry at my kids. The pandemic is making me struggle with greed. The pandemic is causing me to have fear. No, no, no. The pandemic is the circumstance that reveals what exists in our heart. Oh, I'm distant from God. And when I'm distant from God, I give in to lust. When I'm distant from God, I decide to commit murder to try to cover up my sin. So don't use any other perspective, just this one. God, I want your perspective. I want your eyes to see me and to find delight. And you see what I've done. And you see my sin. And it's against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And David verbally says, I have committed evil. It's your eyes that I care about. God, it's your heart that motivates me to run to you. And it's your eyes that help me interpret the situation correctly. David, he went after God's heart and David wanted God's eyes. David gets right into the heart of this psalm and starts to talk about God's work in his life. So he has the willing heart, but it's God's activity. And I'm referring to it as God's hand. Because David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit. Uh, grant me a willing spirit. And that's what I want to go out for just a minute here because. This is not David's activity. This is a willingness and God's hand at work, God's activity. My son Justice uh, used to come out and jump on the riding lawnmower with me. And we would for hours <laughs> mow our big yard. And, and, and Justice had the benefit of being a part of the work, but he didn't have to do any of the work. He just went along for the ride. He just was a part of the journey. Here's what happens with confession. We come before God and we have a willing spirit. That's the way David talks about it. Grant me this willing spirit and it's God at work and we receive the benefit. We get to go along for the ride. And so here's David, he says, create, and he's talking to the creator. So when he says, create in me a clean heart, oh God, he's talking to the one who in Genesis spoke and created. It's the same word, create. Or when you think about in Genesis 33, it says that God spoke and created the stars. He breathes the star. He's the star breather. I mean, David's talking about God possessing so much creative power. Job 26, Job says that when we look at creation, we see just uh, the whisper of God. Who can even fathom the thunder of God? And the idea is, is that when we look at creation, it's just a hint of his power. And so here's David and he's saying, God, you, you are the creator, create in me. You do the work, create in me a clean heart. And then he says, give me a steadfast spirit. That idea is it's, it's not up and down, it's steady, it's consistent. I don't want the up and down life. No, I wanna be steady, God. And David has faced the pain and disappointment of being so far off from where he wants to be with God. And he's saying, I don't wanna be one moment killing giants and becoming king and then later in the depths where I'm far from God and murder and adultery. No, I want a steadfast spirit. God, you do the work. I need the work of your hand. God, you be at work. Create in me 
God, grant me a willing spirit. God, renew me. God, restore me. It's all language of God at work, God's hand at work in his life. It's what we need in our lives. We just go jump on the mower. It's God at work. And God says, I'll do the work. I want from you a willing spirit. I I want from you a willing heart. So today I want to invite you just to take a moment and just come before God and say, God, I'm willing. And first I'd like to invite you just to identify a place in your life that doesn't look like God. Something in your life, it's one of the 10 commandments that's broken in your life. It's a way that you're distant or that you've been ignoring God. It's a way that you're not walking with God. It's something that you, you need like a young Nathan the prophet to walk in and say, hey, this area of your life is not looking like Jesus. Will you just take a moment, will you just, will you just identify that? And now will you confess that to God? Just repent of it. God, here it is, I'm gonna say it to you. It's how I started this message today. What's the one thing in your life that doesn't look like God? What's the worst thing? What's the thing that it doesn't look like God and just take it to him right now. And the last practical thing I wanna encourage you is this. I wanna encourage you to get Nathans in your life. Young, like this young prophet that came to the old king and said, hey, you're the man. We need people in our lives that say, where are you missing the mark? Where, where, where does your life not look like Christ? We need people in our lives that are willing to have that kind of courage to help us on the journey with Jesus. I know for me, just this past week, I had a friend call me and said, where, where in your life does it not look like Jesus right now? In the middle of the COVID-19 season, where have you gotten a little bit weak that, that you wanna just get better? And I confessed it to him right then and there. And it helped me then take that to God. In fact, one of the ways that I found confession work in my life, and maybe this would help you, is I like to just write it in a prayer journal. I'd like to just, in my prayer journal, in addition to the praise and the thanksgiving, to say, God, here's where I'm missing the mark, and look back at my life and say, here is the way that I've responded in a way that's not like you. Because our relationship with God is real and vibrant, and it's not mechanical. It's not a confession one time, and then we just marinate, and one day we'll go to heaven. No, 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 it's a relationship that's vibrant, It's a relationship where we want to be transformed, to be like him, to be close to him. And so just like David is sad when he disappoints the heart of God, so we too, man, we've got this real relationship. Right now, my son Dawson's standing right behind this camera right here. He's 15 years old. He's my dear friend and my son. And, And that relationship has real conversation. And we both go through some good days and some bad days. And your relationship with God, it's not mechanical. You're not a machine. You're a human being made in the image of God. And you've got some moments where you really do look like you're an image bearer of what God looks like. And you've got moments where you fall so short. And confession is the journey where we get to come before God and get clean. Confession is this process where it's your privilege to come before him and say, here I am. Maybe today you want to begin a journey with Jesus. Maybe you want to get right with God. Let's just do that right now. You can just pray this prayer. Just look to him and say, God, I give you my life. I step over the line of faith. Change me. I don't want to go my way. I want to go yours. I repent of living for me. Change me. Make me a new person in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we as Radiant Church are committed to you and your journey with Jesus. I'd like to invite you just to click in the chat below right there and tell us that you made a decision to follow Jesus. Let us know it. And then we'd love to connect with you. And so if you can just, if you could just click in the chat, it will be able to connect with you. I want to send you some resources. Just let us know. If you're watching on Facebook, you can direct message us. If you're watching on the website, you can even say it in the chat or you could just click it there and then message us. If you're watching on YouTube, you can just email us, yes, at radiantchurchkc.com. But we want to be in contact with you and help you on your journey with Jesus. And last thing is this, Radiant Church, I just want to encourage you. We're in a great season. We're in a season, though it's a season where we've been more isolated than we want to be. People are coming to know Jesus. We're being connected in small groups. And I'd encourage you right now, as we go into this next week and we start a new summer small group semester, I want to encourage you to get connected in small groups. Hey, we're praying live every Wednesday night. If you're able to jump on and be a part of that Wednesday night prayer meeting at 7.30 p.m., do that. If you're able to jump on to any of the noon Instagrams and pray, do that. 
Uh, even tonight, we're gonna have this outside connect so that we're still socially distanced, but we've got an opportunity to see one another. Go to our social media and check that out. Last thing I just wanna encourage you is this. We desire to gather as soon as we can. And we will as soon as uh, we see that it is acceptable and legally right to gather. Know that it's the desire of our heart and we wanna gather as soon as we can. And I wanna encourage you not to be discouraged in this season, but be encouraged. And even in this time, there are ways that you can connect and look for every single possible way that you can and uh, keep connecting in each one of those. Every single Saturday, we're working on ways to serve other people. There's a lot of, there's a lot of ways that we're able to gather and connect right now other than just the Sunday morning gathering. But soon, and very soon, we will uh, be gathering at Fiorella's, and I can't wait for that day. I love you. I just want to give you that update. Thanks so much for being a part of Radiant Church. Our best days are in front of us. Have a great Sunday. Hey, Radiant Church, what a great day. Thank you so much for gathering together online with us. It's been an awesome day. It was such a great message. We really hope you enjoyed it. And thanks again for gathering with us. If you said yes to following Jesus today, you made the best decision you'll ever make in your entire life. As a church, we wanna resource you and walk alongside you in this journey. If you would, email us at yes at radiantchurchkc.com and we'll send you some information about following Jesus and helping you take your next steps in your journey with Christ. And hey, thanks so much for all of you who came out and supported City Union Mission through our Feed the Need um, canned food drive and perishable items. You came up in full force and we are so grateful for all that you're doing for our community together. It's been amazing. I've, I've loved seeing the church make a difference during this season. And it's been amazing just to see all the different ways, whether it's been through small groups, surf projects, surf days, all of the different ways so that we've been able to make a difference. Yeah. So thank you for being a part of that. And if you'd like to make a difference through your generosity, you can do that in a couple easy ways. You can go online to radiantchurchkc.com to give today, or you can go, you can text the amount that you'd like to give to number 84321. Once you hit send, it'll walk you through a really easy process. And thank you for your generosity. It's been amazing to see the impact we've been able to have in Kansas City. And hey, we want to keep connecting with you all throughout the week. So be sure to follow us at Radiant Church KC on all your social platforms and on YouTube for the Wednesday night prayer meeting that we host live every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. And make sure if God is doing something in your life, make sure you tag us and let us know. Yes, we we love would it. love to see that. And not only is it encouraging to us, it's actually encouraging to other people. When God does something in your life, chances are he's able to use that impact to affect somebody else's life. So Tag us, share us, let us know what God has done in your life. We are praying for you and we love you so much, Radiant. We'll see you later tonight at the prayer drive-through at Fiorella's.